Hi, Sophia Jean. Thanks for talking to me today. Hello. Good to see you, Tashin. Likewise. Uh, so as usual, I'd love to just hear you start by telling us who you are and what your story or background is and how you came to be where you are today in your life. So I'm Sophia Jean. It rhymes with sun. Um, I got, I guess I can start with where I got this name. It might be a good intro. Mm -hmm. um, and I got this name because my parents each chose a part of the name that they liked. And my dad liked Sophia. And my mom chose the name Jeanne because she had a very important teacher in her life who was named Jeanne, who died, I think, shortly before or after my conception, around the time of my conception. And so I was gifted this hyphenated long combination name. Um, maybe I'll just, I'll do like a brief, a brief history. So I grew up in New York City in downtown Manhattan. It's a pretty cool place to grow up for me. Um, I really enjoyed like the liveliness of the city. It's a very, to me, New York City has always been like a hub of like activity and passion and like life in many different ways. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, classic childhood. I'll skip through a lot of that. And uh, I ended up going away for college. I spent some time in New Orleans. Um, which was really impactful to me because I spent, so the first 18 years of my life in the North, and then I moved to the South, which had a very different, very different orientation, a very different culture. And something about that was like my first, the first experience I had in my life of um, like a sense of opposites that I then had to integrate. And so going back and forth between New York and New Orleans, I started to integrate these two very different cultures. And I actually traveled quite a bit, like from, you know, from like high school to the end of college, I traveled a lot. And so I was really interested in experiencing a lot of different cultures. And I think that that period for me was really um, foundational in um, like all the different points of reference that I saw for how to live a life, something like that. Um, and there was a point about like halfway through college for me where things started shifting in my life, um, basically on the heels of a really bad breakup that I had that was just like excruciating and so painful. And I just like suffered miserably for two years. And then I was like, okay, you know, I've got to do something about this. This, is not, this isn't going to work anymore. Whatever I've been doing is not working. And that's when I started, I found like meditation and I like found a bunch of random breath practices online that I started doing. Not sure if that was a good idea, but it was like, um, uh, it was like my like foot in the door. Um, and after that, I started doing a lot of yoga. I was really into acro yoga because I had a background as a gymnast. Um, and I was really into yoga for maybe three to five years during which like, you know, I did yoga teacher training and I got really interested in Buddhism because my main teacher was also a very serious Buddhist, the very interesting practice that she loved to share. Um, and that just sort of launched me into my own exploration of how I wanted to live my life. And so it feels kind of like from age 20 to 30. So I th turned 30 a few months ago. And in that decade, I really prioritized my own growth. I don't think I really thought about it that way. I didn't think about like, oh, like I'm growing, you know, but like all of the things I was learning and all of the things that really mattered to me were things that were helping me grow in various ways. Um, I think I did that somewhat to the detriment of my early career. Um, I ended up doing a number of different things. I worked in food system sustainability for like three years. And I was in software engineering for two years until I really did my full transition towards organizational psychology and completed my master's at, at Columbia. Um, so I feel like I've now properly like shifted towards or reoriented towards the sense of a career after like really bumbling my way along through my 20s. Um, which is really lovely because I tried so hard during that time. Like I was really, really trying to figure out like, what do I do? And I've always been so curious about so many things, which is amazing, but also can make it difficult to choose. 
Um, and so there was, when I had that switch, there's a really wonderful sense of like, okay, like all of this, all of this stuff that felt like I was like swimming in milk, like I finally created the cream, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there's like, it does feel like there's something now that I'm standing on, like a foundation I built, even though it didn't feel like I was building anything while I was doing it. It felt like I was just like making a huge mess. Um, but I, I just, I have so much appreciation now for all of that, like weird, strange work that I did to get here. Cause it, it did, it, it worked. Mm. So, yeah. How would you describe this foundation that you've built? Like what, what is that like for you or what is it made of? It's a good question. And the way that it summarizes, which I think is different than it's parts the way that it summarizes is like a sort of like self-possession um like a like a sense that I know where I stand like with myself um I think I've always been quite like confident and independent so I think a lot of other people might have said that I seemed like that but it didn't feel like that and it's very different to for something to look like it than to have the experience of it being so. Um, and I've, I've actually been, I've been, I've been considering this question because a lot of what I did, I did without really knowing what I was doing, even like the meditation and the yoga and my explorations in Buddhism. And then like a few other things that I've done after that, getting farther into meditation, getting into various relational practices. Like I, I didn't have a context or like a conceptual understanding of why I was choosing what I was. I just purely went with my sense of like curiosity basically, but not like, and it's not like flagrant curiosity. It's like, like deep seated curiosity. Like it was just like orienting my whole body towards these things. Um, and I think those, there's like some self-awareness that went along with that. I went through like three years of like intense, like emotional training, like figuring out how to stop denying all my emotions and to like feel them in a way that was like appropriate and like not overwhelming. Um, like a, there's sort of like a gradual like confidence building that like I can, I can function in a way that makes sense. Like I know how to act to create certain outcomes. Um, not in a controlling way, but in a like, I'm seeing reality clearly enough to act in a way that makes sense given my goals or my hopes. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Hmm. One thing I'd be curious to ask you about from your background is, uh, from my understanding, you have sort of an unusual background in that, uh, hmm. if I'm not mistaken, you grew up in a Gurdjieff based community. Is that right? Mm, yeah. So, so I, I grew up in, in New York city and I live with my parents in like a small one bedroom apartment mm -hmm. on the 14th floor of a wonderful building that was very dog friendly. And <laughs> both of my parents separately had been involved in the Gurdjieff work for, an, I think a few decades at that point, by the time they had me, they had me rather late in both of their lives. They were both, I think they were both 45 or right around there. Um, and they actually met through a mutual friend in the work, we call it the work. Um, and so most of, uh, like most of my parents' friends were from that world. And so they were my godparents and they were like the people who babysat me and they were like the places we went for holidays. And so I grew up very much around people who were immersed in that. Um, there are some areas where like the Gurdjieff work has become very culty, like in California in particular, there are a few like super culty pockets. The, the New York pocket doesn't seem to be as culty. I don't know how much of that is due to it being, it's like totally non-residential, you know, there's like a center in Manhattan where you go for events and stuff. Um, but that's really different from like living on a farm together or something. Um, and my dad actually, he spent some time when he was, when he lived in California in the more culty aspects of it. And I'm really glad that I missed that part. Mm -hmm. um, but I did from a young age, I did um, movements with them. I didn't do it for a long time. I think I was interested for a bit and then I wasn't interested and I wanted to do gymnastics. So my mom, you know, she was, she was very uh, supportive of my interests in that way. Um, so I did some movements, which are um, sort of, are you familiar? 
With a little bit, but the, uh, anyone listening might not. So feel free to. Yeah. Explain. So, so it's a, it's a bit like a sort of dance that has a, um, it has a structure and it often has a very clear um, beat and they're done to music. And the point of movements is to try to come in touch with a sense of your body in a way that allows these complex movements to become easeful because they tend to be quite mentally complicated. So if you try to do it by thinking about it a lot, you really just can't keep up with it. And so it's a way of um, like helping your body get into the space where it can do the movements rather than like you thinking about it and then telling your body what to do. Um, you can look up videos of them on YouTube. If you look up like Gurdjieff uh, movements, you can find um, they've done shows. They did a show a few years ago up at Columbia that I saw, which was cool. I think it can look, uh, it can look a bit weird to people. Like it probably looks like something you haven't seen before. Um, but it's interesting. My mom's been very involved in that. She, um, she practiced it and continues to, um, has been very involved in that. Um, and then there were also like, uh, work groups. There were like kids groups that we went to upstate where it's just like a group of kids. And you basically just like, it's, it, a lot of it is uh, based around physical labor around like using your body and like building things. So we like built this lean to out in the woods there. And the, the thing that I remember most about it, besides like like fun to hang out with kids in the woods is like the um the adults who led them during meals they would always like they would pop in these questions that were like very philosophical and they'd be like I'm trying to I'm trying to remember like a good one I like what I remember is like the feeling in my body of like it's like 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 they just like blew a big bubble and then it popped and then like everyone's kind of quiet like looking around and wondering what's happening mm -hmm. um, and they would ask these questions like um like like like, what does it mean when I, when I speak or something like that, something like that, you know, <laughs> and my brain would kind of go like, <laughs> exactly. Um, so I wasn't heavily involved. I didn't, I, like, I can't say properly, like grew up in the community, but it was very, very much a part of like my parents' lives for a while. My dad stepped away from it and started doing more like peer to peer stuff. It can be a little more hierarchical. Um, and he wasn't interested in that anymore. Um, but it definitely influenced my parents a lot and thus me. And, um, I think being around people who are focused in that way, like kind of gave me an idea of adults that was maybe a little different than the average idea of adults mm. in like that orientation towards like consciousness or attention. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Something I'm curious about hearing you talk about this is like, I'm remembering my own childhood and I was raised mm -hmm. Unitarian Universalist and that's mm -hmm. just um, I'm very grateful to that and I have things that I like about it and things I don't like about it and it's but in any mm -hmm. case it's very very different than sort of the spiritual cultural milieu that I found myself in in my 20s and mm -hmm. certainly now and I'm curious like what you would how you would describe uh, yeah the the like cultural feeling of this kind of community of practice and anything that you really appreciate about it in retrospect. Mm -hmm. There is a certain like vibe that I really appreciate. And I just remember the feeling of like walking into the main building there or in the space at state, like there's this really deep stillness that like, I really appreciate and that I find in very, very few places. Um, yeah, that's the main thing that comes to mind. I'm trying to like see if I can say more about, about that. Uh, I think there, there are a lot of different ways that people do spirituality and I know very few of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I know this one and I never called it spirituality. And I, I've been like very cautiously beginning to use the word spirituality, but I still, I don't know what most people mean when they say it or the people who say it, where I think they do know what they mean. I don't agree with their meaning, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just like, it feels like very rocky territory. Um, but in that space, I did find like, there's a certain sincerity that people have of practice 
um, that, is, that is really impactful. And even uh, like the sincerity itself is, a, is enough. Like even if you're not quite able to do it, when you're sincerely trying, like that is beautiful. Like that creates a certain sort of space. Um, and it's also important that people actually can do it, do it. I know I'm like, you know, do, do what I could say, like, pay attention, like actually pay attention in a way that, um, like, uh, how do I say this? Like, if I'm like, if I'm holding this ball, like I can pay attention to this ball without noticing like anything else. Like there might be so much going on here in my paying attention to the ball that I'm completely unaware of because I'm just like looking at the ball there's another way you can pay attention where it's like you're aware of the entire situation of like the ball being held in the environment and so that's closer to what I mean when I say like doing it like when you when you have a sort of attention that really encompasses the like the task that you're attending to mm -hmm. like it's important that people can actually do that and like the sincerity that I felt there even from people who couldn't quite do it yet it like, it's, it's deeply impactful. It's deeply mm. impactful to be in a space like that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, it's reminding me of something that's come up in our conversations in the past about like, and you'll be able to describe this better than I will, but something to the effect mm. of that, perhaps that community of practice had kind of a shared value of not talking so much about what's being done right. and doing it more. Yeah. And I'd be curious to hear you speak about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> which is ironic, I realize, but here we are on yeah. my podcast. Yeah. No, I think it's, I think it's very, it's very good. It's a, it's a, I think it's a good thing to talk about as long as you do it uh, well, which I think uh -huh. we've spoken of before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, where do I want to start? Well, so I think this does run pretty deep in me because of this. So there, there, we have specific groups in which we would talk about how our practice was going. And often like one person speaks and then the group leader responds and then another person speaks and the group leader responds. And in more like mature groups, apparently I haven't been in the more mature groups, but my mom has, and she tells me about it. They have, they do more peer to peer responding and talking. Um, and so that is, is a space in which you would like openly share about your experience and get feedback, get perspectives, not, not in a conversational way. Like the goal is only to speak if you can speak in a way that is meaningful. Um, and outside of those groups that you talk about other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 can, I really can see the benefit of that because it can be easy to talk about things and then not do them or to think you're doing them because you're talking about them. And talking about them can be an essential step towards doing them, but it can also be a place that you never step from. Um, and I guess that, yeah, I can see how like, especially from our previous conversations, <laughs> how that's factored in. Um, but like I said before, um, I'd like, I think there is a really important like way in which it's just really hard to speak truly about a lot of this stuff. And for me, like, if I can't speak truly, then I'd rather not speak. Hmm. Yeah. I'm getting the sense that from hearing you talk about it, that there's in that community speech is held to a very high standard and especially speech about these practices and that you basically don't do it except in certain sort of like sacralized containers of setting certain settings where it's understood how powerful speech is and what kind of speech is okay like um, where it would be appropriate to speak about these things and how to do it and would you qualify right. that yeah, I would definitely qualify it. Mm -hmm. So there's there's um, there's an emphasis on silence, on the benefit of silence, and of how much more deeply you can see when you're silent because mm. it reduces the amount of activity in the system. Mm. Um, 
And there is also like, there's a way you can take that sense of like sacredness of words a little too far, or you can rigidify it in a way that's like, all of a sudden you're making this big effort to speak in a meaningful way. And so I've definitely seen teachers um, kind of like push against that and be a little lighter or be a little bit more frivolous. And I know, especially in my later years, like when I moved back to New York, I was in my mid twenties, I started going to a group again. And it was around the same time that I started circling, just like a relational practice where it's very interactive and like intersubjective. And I started really kind of pushing back on the Gurdjieff work container mm. because I, just, I like so much wanted to bring that like liveliness mm. into it. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I want to come back to circling in a second, but just to follow this thread a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I have a sense of it from the way you talk about it, but let's let's make it explicit here yeah, and sure. for anyone listening. Like, what what does it yeah. mean to you? What are you referring to to like speak well or uh, speak truly about something or or sort of have mm -hmm. this authentic speech? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. That, that I know what I say is true. Mm. It doesn't need to be true in an absolute sense, like not like uh, not like universalistic or something like that. But but I'm like actively attending to clarity. Mm. Mm. You seem. Uh in a different emotional space answering that question. <laughs> what, what's that like for you? It felt important that I do it uh, earnestly, honestly. Like for, to me, based on my like, you know, my personality structure, like one of the worst things someone can do is to like preach something like that while actively doing something else. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's a high on my list of like, uh, like just really gross things to me. <laughs> mm. 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 I'm curious about where that one comes from. I'm not sure. Mm. Mm. Well, what just happened just now, I think was a little flavor of circling, uh, <laughs> which I would be curious to hear you talk about. Uh, what your experience mm. of it was, maybe, maybe just to start with what your sort of history with circling is and how you mm. got into it and that, you know, the trainings you did and such like that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so I think this, the simplest way to describe circling is that it's a here and now practice, which means you focus on current moment experience. So um, what you're sharing or what you're asking about, like all of that information, you should be able to find in the moment in your current experience. So you don't need to source from like imagining if, and you don't need to source from what happened back then. You can really source from what's happening right here and now. Um, and that it's relational. So a lot of what comes up in circling is relational dynamics. What's it like to be with you? What's it like for you to be with me in this moment? Because there's so much information right here if we can explore what comes up between us. Um, so that's my basic circling shtick. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I started circling about five years ago. A friend of mine got into it and he started having a, inviting people over to circle. And so I started going. And shortly after that, for some reason, it felt appropriate to start facilitating circling. <laughs> so I think after about a month of, <laughs> about, about, after about a month of circling, um, I, started, I started bringing it to other people. And at the time, I was at the Recur Center, which is a like a writer's retreat, but for programmers. So it's a three month, it's a three month program. And you you do programming, anything from hardware to software. It's like very loose and a really wonderful like space of really smart, kind people. And I was like, oh, these people would love to circle with me. Mm -hmm. And so I started hosting circling for our cohort, um, and it was just really fun. And it was, I was able to interact with people in a different way than I was used to. And I found it very interesting. Just very interesting to kind of like go deeper together and like reveal more of what happened for all of us together. Um, and it was a way of relating that I wasn't familiar with, 
but what I've realized is like I remember like in high school I would have these like really like late night soul conversations with friends you know and we'd be up like super late and be so tired in the morning these conversations were like amazing and I started sort of got a flavor of that like it was like a level of connection that often only felt accessible at like 3 a.m for some reason um that I was now able to kind of tap more into using these like cool tools that I was learning from circling um so I kept doing it in that way. I was facilitating for a while in Manhattan and in Brooklyn when I was living there. Um, and then when I was preparing for, for graduate school, I realized I would have like a really good um, like period during which to do additional trainings before I started my master's. And so I decided to do the six month SAS, which is circling Europe, six month circling training during that time. And it was like three blocks from my house. And it was just like the, the like, the setup of it was just like perfect. Um, and so with a group of 30 people over the course of six months, we trained together and how to how to circle and how to facilitate circling. Um, and after that, um, when I was at um, teacher's college, I facilitated a bunch, like did, um, it was like over two semesters, we did like weekly circling with people there and also invited people from the outside to join us. Um, and then I continued, I always spent some time up at Maple at the Monastic Academy and I did circling there. And I think by now I've led like three or four circling retreats, like week long circling retreats up, up there. Mm -hmm. And actually just got back a few weeks ago from the last one. Mm, wonderful. So, wonderful. Yeah. Hmm. What, what has that practice of circling been like for you? I mean, you mentioned that it, it, it has this kind of intimacy that you experienced in other contexts, like, you know, being up at 3am talking to your friends or something, but mm -hmm. what, what, what did you find in these practices that really resonated so much for you? Mm -hmm. The first thing that comes to mind around this is like a sense of like getting under the surface of things. Um, it's like a lot of conversation that's um, very content oriented, which is like amazing and wonderful. And that there's also another layer below that of like everything I'm thinking and feeling and everything you are thinking and feeling like in like behind all of what we're actually saying. Mm -hmm. um, and you can even go like a little scientific with this that like only five to 10% of what we understand about what someone says is based on the words they say and the rest is just like body language and like however else we're reading them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just like such richness there when you, start to pay attention to more aspects of the interaction you're in yeah you the way your your face is you looked kind of like like you knew what I was talking about yeah I mean it, it reminds me of what I really appreciate about you of uh and I, I mentioned this to you before but I think there's plenty of people that I'm able to connect to on a, in a kind of intellectual or content level, as you say, where it's like, wow, there's interesting things to talk about here. And then I think there are people that are really good at the things that circling points out where it's like, they're emotionally aware, self-aware, and they're aware of other people and they're empathetic and can kind of mm -hmm. um, relate on that level. Um, but having both of those skill sets, um, you know, along with some of the things that I associate maybe more with like meditation or, you know, contemplative practice or just like internal mm -hmm. self-awareness and, and, you know, ability to attend to things and focus and be present and things like this, which is sort of overlaps with circling, but isn't quite necessarily the same. Um, or like they were different in how I circumstantially came to have those practices. Yeah. Um, in any case, like you have a really good balance of like being able to engage on each of those levels like to be present with yourself to be present mm -hmm. with me or whoever you're talking to in a really deep way and then also to like reflect intellectually and like on a meta level like mm -hmm. oh um you know about the ideas that are relevant to what's being mm -hmm. discussed and that's something i've always mm -hmm. really appreciated about you so um mm -hmm. that's really what was coming up for me as you talked cool. about that yeah 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 those different levels are are very important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to like take us too far away. Mm. And like, when you say that, I'm like, I'm, so I'm planning on applying for 
I am applying for PhD programs this fall. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been thinking about is like integrating into research, the like first, second and third person perspectives Mm -hmm. in terms of the subjective, the intersubjective and the like objective. Mm -hmm. And usually like science in general focuses on the objective. And in terms of the work that I've done, the subjective and the intersubjective are both like extremely important. And I've, I've just been really curious about how all of those can be integrated and how like the wisdom of all of those can, um, can come together more and how we understand things even conceptually. Yeah, so I appreciate a, the way you pointed it out. Yeah. Hmm. Can you give an example just for someone listening of what each of those three levels are? Yeah, so, so my subjective experience which is describe the way I'm experiencing anything. So this room around me, how the colors look to me, the way I'm interpreting this thing that you're doing Mm -hmm. right now, all of that would be the subjective. Um, The intersubjective, you can also call it the group, but it can, it can be a sense of like shared reality. Like what's our, what's our mutual understanding here? Um, How are we seeing the space together? Um, How are we understanding each other? And so it's intersubjective because the first one is subjective, right? So it's intersubjective. So there is a sense of like two worlds, but then there is also a space that is shared. So what we have in common in terms of what we understand can come together in a group so that a group can function almost as its own organism when information and understanding is shared um, in a, like when that information can flow freely among people, you can have a situation in which a group can function almost like a, a single organism. Um, and then the objective is like, you know, there's a lot of, there's, there's some conflict about whether that's possible. Mostly people just say it's not possible to actually have objectivity. Um, but when we get enough eyes on something, we can kind of say like, okay, majority rules. Like we think this is as close as we can get to like what most people would say is actually happening. Mm -hmm. Like that this carpet here is basically rectangular. Mm-hmm. And so we can agree it's rectangular. We may have different understandings of what rectangular means, mm-hmm. but as long as we can use that word and point at the same thing together, mm-hmm. it's okay, even if our ideas of it are are different inside. So, so like like we're both wearing headphones would be an objective thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Intersubjective might be like we're having a conversation for a podcast, and then subjective might be like uh, I feel curious about this conversation or something. Totally. Okay, yeah, great. Totally. Um, yeah, that makes me want to ask, just coming back to circling a little bit about uh, sort of the um, heights and the uh, <laughs> like pits of circling, because I feel like it has both. And you were sort of yeah. um, getting at the heights there of these like intersubjective stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm very curious about that. And I want to make sure we talk about it. And I'd also yeah. be curious to hear you talk about the, <laughs> the, the lows of circling, um, which is something that we've talked about on this podcast mm. before. And um, yeah, but let's start with the heights. Like what, <laughs> what is going on there with these intersubjective mm-hmm. experiences? Like how did you start to notice those? What exactly is possible there? What do you think mm-hmm. about that? Tell me more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like running through in my mind a few of the like archetypal scenarios. Um, So I think it's like, it's hard to overestimate the degree to which we each come into an interaction with uh, assumptions. Like, I think in general, we are vastly unaware of how many assumptions and how large our assumptions are about who we are, why we do the things that we do, who other people are, why they're doing what they do. And that like massive assumption net can really hinder communication because I'm imagining you're sad, but actually you're happy and you're crying because you're happy. And that's a very simplistic like example. Um, But one thing that starts to happen in circling because there's a much freer flow of feedback, like people share impact really readily and you will hear how you impact the group when you share. Like someone in that group will tell you and even no impact is like an impact. Like that is feedback, you know? And it's uncommon to get 
that much direct feedback in daily life. Often people just tamp it down. It can be politer or easier or more professional just not to give much feedback and kind of like on my world, your world is over there. We'll just kind of, you know, make this work. And so when you, when that feedback begins, you actually start to be able to be on the same page. And I think this can speak both to the highs and the lows because sometimes what you learn is very difficult. Mm. Like the things you learn about the assumptions you're making or the things you learn about the way people are seeing you, like that can be really helpful. It can also be really painful um, because often other people can see things about us that we can't because they're just like our water. Like we've been swimming in them our whole lives. And so we don't notice them. But when other people look at us, it's very stark because they see that our water is very different from someone else's water. It's much easier to make that distinction. Mm. And so I think some of the highs come from like, it's sort of like an unfolding or an unraveling of all of these like assumptions and preconceptions about what is true about the world and me and you and us. And the, that can create so much openness for like new ways of understanding and relating that can bring just so much joy and like compassion and love. Um, and just the, even just the openness to be able to look at a lot of those things itself um, can be quite incredible. Um, and I think the, the lows come in that same space because a lot of the reason that we um, don't show impact or that we keep things in is because there's a lot that's really challenging to handle. Another thing I think we underestimate is like the, um, like the extent of our inability to manage emotion. Um, like most of the emotion that most of us feel is like the tip of <laughs> our icebergs and the rest you just don't notice until you really like pay a lot of attention. You're like, oh, there's like an entire like cavern of emotion I've been sitting on that's been very effectively kept down because I actually couldn't handle it. Um, but when you do certain practices or you engage in certain spaces, more of that can come up because it's very clear that it's allowed. Um, and that can be extremely difficult. Um, and there's not, um, there's not always like the degree of therapeutic skill that some people may need to be held in um, to recover certain experiences or to um, move through certain experiences, which I think is where a lot of the low points come in. Hmm. Yeah. As a facilitator of circling, how do you like to set up a circling environment so that it mm -hmm. is conducive to these heights arising and that it's like safe for people and isn't just like unnecessarily hurtful or damaging or something like that? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you like to facilitate to make circling you know, a helpful and beneficial experience rather than a harmful and hurtful experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think a, a really important part of it, which I think is counter, it's counterintuitive. And often when people see me do it, they think I'm being mean, mm. but there's a way that if you pretend to be nice about something um, or you're just being empathetic or you're just kind of like letting someone emote, um, that it can actually be unhealthy. Um, and so to me, one of the like most important things is that I am always willing to, um, to like to speak up, to step up when, um, like in my best understanding of things, like that is the right thing to do. And it can be extremely uncomfortable to like interrupt someone who's crying. Mm. Like that can be very uncomfortable for a lot of people and can seem bad and mean and maybe even cruel and like not understanding. Um, and so there are a lot of like moves that are important that you can make that go against the grain of um, like standard etiquette, I would say. Um, and that's not to say the right thing to do is to like be forceful or to step in. Like I may, I may err too much on that side, you know, and I think less so like perhaps I've become more mature in my like older years, you know? Um, um, but I think one of the most beautiful things that a facilitator can do is like bring more nuance to the experience that the group is having. 
And that is often what can enable people to sink deeper into an experience. Um, Cause there's something about like putting your finger on a sense of what's, what's going on that um, can be deeply relieving. Cause otherwise it can just be a generalized anxiety. But when you have a sense of what's happening it can be like extremely calming. Um, and I've just seen people like you, you can like switch on a dime when something about um, the way you're holding your experience shifts or the way you're making meaning shifts. And often the group can be really um, pivotal in supporting that. Um, so like one of the practices we do, we do like surrendered leadership, which means like, um, like everyone is fully responsible for the circle. And so to me, the most danger in a circle is if like no one is holding their leadership. Like that's when things just really go to shit when no one is willing to act in the way that they, that they deeply know is right. That is like an extremely dangerous situation to be in, whether you're in a circle or whether you're at work or whether you're in a community, like that is the thing that creates danger. And then there's some like logistical stuff around like, um, like knowing your own capacity. And like, if people have like really deep trauma or have a lot of difficulty relating, circling may not be a great place to start. Like they may need to start on like a dyad relationship with an individual therapist. And so just kind of having a broad, um, a broad look at that in terms of what people's capacities are and um, uh, like ho holding that, holding, holding that truly, yeah. How would you see the relationship between interpersonal practices like circling, something like therapy, and something like contemplative practices like meditation? Mm -hmm. Oof, the hard hitter there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess most easily I can speak to them like in my own life. I think mm -hmm. different points of entrance are just easier for different people. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm alone on my cushion, like for me being alone has been a very comfortable place. Like when I'm upset in general, I have tended to be alone. And I've, I've like, I think as I've done more of these practices, like I've become more comfortable, like um, opening up in a group or with other people. Mm -hmm. But in general, like it's been much easier for me to like go sit by myself, whether I'm like, you know, just sitting on the ground crying or like sitting on a cushion meditating. Um, and I think for other people, the like the aspect of circling of being in a group of people can be a much easier introduction to a certain sort of self-awareness and other awareness, um, because there's something about being social, um, like as social creatures and getting feedback. I think that can be like a really important part of um, people's growth. And then, so I came to therapy last, actually, I only started doing therapy um when I started my master's and I was like 28 so like two or three years ago so that was the last one I started sitting when I was 20 and I started circling when I was 25 and I started therapy when I was 28 um and I have a very very good therapist she's 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 so skillful um and like the way she's able to lead me so slowly through very intense experiences, but like slowly enough that I'm never overwhelmed. It's like, it's a very specific skill set, And you, I don't think you could do that with more than one person at a time, like to hold them that closely. Um, and so there are aspects of that that can be done in meditation. There are aspects of that that can be done in circling. They can be done in different ways in each of the spaces. Um, but I, it is, I think there are different, like, it might be a different match based on where you are in your life what avenues are most accessible to you. Um, to me, they've definitely been like, um, like a braid or something like that, um, where like some strands are thicker at different parts of my life. Um, they've all had really important, they've all had really important impacts on me. I feel like there's like, there's something I haven't quite touched on that feels like important about their relationship. I'm just gonna try to like find the tail of that cat. Mm 
So on one hand, I think there's a way you can say that each of them holds all of the others, like that you can do the individual, you can do the dyadic and you can do the group in different ways in each modality. Um, and so in some way, there are just, there are different ways into um, like similar experiences. Um, but they also have very different flavors. And because we all have um, like tendencies towards one or the other or the other, I think it can be really important to get a taste for each of them um, as a way to see an alternative perspective because it can be easy to get too stuck in any one of them. And so having at least two that you can um, look between so you can see what's happening from two slightly different perspectives, um, I think is really crucial in like developing like a holistic understanding of what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be easy to imagine someone that like just meditates a whole lot on their own, but doesn't get feedback from other people about how their mm -hmm. words or impact them or something like that. And mm -hmm. circling could be really good for that. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Um, yeah, I think, I think for myself, I'd be curious what you think about this, but for myself, like the way I was, I, I like what you said about how you can ha hold the individual or the dyadic or the group with different mm -hmm. sort of intents. I think the way I was conceiving of it is like, by and large, this is sort of hand wavy and, you know, categorizing, but um, mm -hmm. uh, like meditation is about like truth seeking as an individual and circling might be about like truth seeking in a collective structure. And then mm -hmm. uh, therapy would about be about like healing personally with mm -hmm. the support of another person, but that like mm -hmm. therapy and circling and meditation overlap in terms of what things, what kinds of phenomena they're looking at, but the intent mm -hmm. and the like, how many people you're doing it with mm -hmm. uh, varies. Yeah, the, the other thing I'm noting is that you can also think about it in terms of like skill or function. Um, so like what skills are you building in meditation? Some of this will depend on how you meditate. There are some things that are common across different techniques. The way you do therapy, the way you circle, these things will affect the specific skills you're building. And so it can be interesting to think about it in terms of what skills you're building or the function that that practice has for you when you think about these things. It can be hard to, it can be really hard to see what skill you're building. But I think if you can deduce it somehow, that that can be really powerful as you like navigate those different um, like practice spaces. What would you say the skills are that you've built through circling in particular? Okay. So I think this, so there are some things that are general and there are some things that will be more like individual specific, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I think a, a big one was like the willingness to speak about the experience I'm having underneath the surface and to listen when other people speak, to see what I hear beneath what they're saying on their surface. Like that one is like very big for me. Um, the next piece I would say is like, like something like speaking my truth. I freaking hate that term. Um, but something like that, like being willing to, um, like trust my experience enough, not trusting that it's right, but just trusting that it's the experience I'm having and that bringing that can contribute to my own or someone else's understanding. And I, I, I won't necessarily have any idea before I share it, um, what that is or whether it will be useful. And it's so, it's been so important for me to learn, to share more about what's coming up for me. I think I tend to be more private. I tend to be more internal. And so giving more voice and sharing that has been, um, it's reflected back to me a lot about the way that I am part of a group. Um, and the way that like my experience matters, even when it's very different from anything else that's happening and can even be like a really crucial key 
in, um, in gaining group coherence. Um, so yeah, so the willingness to speak, to speak up about what's happening. Um, and I think the third thing I would say is there's really like a slowing down, like getting comfortable slowing down and really teasing out what might be happening is a skill that I've learned that I really, really value. Yeah. Are there any growth edges that you have that you're currently exploring when you do circling? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's actually the same growth edge I was exploring as I debated preparing for this call, <laughs> which is like, I've generally been like an extreme over preparer. Like, even like, I remember like in high school when I would study for tests, like, unless I felt like I could answer every question confidently, like I was not prepared enough. Like I didn't mind over preparing. I was never like, some people like want to prepare just enough so that they can get the right grade. But I wanted to like know everything and like know it so well that I could like effortlessly do this test. <laughs> it's kind of funny hearing myself say this, but it's like very true and has like held very true. And preparation is amazing and great and crucial and a really important skill and everyone should do it, myself included. Um, and it's also very interesting to prepare in a different way, which is like to prepare your own state, which can be similar to preparing content, but not necessarily. And so what I oriented towards when it was like time was coming up to this call was like preparing my state. Like what sort of state do I wanna be in? What sort of headspace do I wanna be in? And how do I get myself there? Like, what do I need to do to get myself there? Do I need some meditation? Do I need to just go like hang out with my family? Do I need to like go eat a Snickers bar and watch the chickens? You know, what is it? And so there's kind of like this cool puzzle of figuring out, not like, what do I need to know? But like, how do I wanna be when I arrive? in this call or somewhere else. And so encircling the way this often shows up and one of my favorite practice exercises actually is talking without knowing what you'll say. And depending on who you are and you're like, some people are really comfortable spontaneity, others aren't, but this can be a very, very interesting practice. And so I've been trying to like, kind of like let emerge more rather than like creating something and then like giving it. Um, and that to me is definitely, has definitely been, uh, a growth edge that I'm sort of like expanding more and more until it like governs my entire life. How did you, uh, what kind of state did you want to be in for this conversation and how did you arrive at that or prepare for it? Um, so there's definitely like a groundedness I wanted, like that like sort of like self-possession, but there's also like the liveliness and also like the intellectual component. Um, so what I ended up doing, what did I end up doing? I did, I sat, on, I sat on the porch with my mom and my dad and my sister and her baby for a little while. And we just kind of like, you know, chatted and I was playing with my niece who's 18 months old and kind of like hanging out in the sun. And my mom was, was saying something about this Native American song about the sun that she knew. So my mom and my sister and me and my niece all sang the song on the, on the porch while we looked at the sun. <laughs> you can't create this sort of stuff, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then I like looked at your questions a little bit, but I was just kind of like letting them sink in. And I could, I noticed sometimes like my mind would start trying to make up dialogues. I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's like not how I want to do this. <laughs> And so just kind of like settling, settling in a way where I'm like relaxed, but also um, like attentive. I think that probably characterizes the, like, I need to be like, like, uh, like, so there's not so much stress or anxiety that I'm focusing on that, but that there's like enough energy that I'm like properly attending. That makes that good make sense? sense. Yes, yeah. definitely. Hmm. Well, I'd like to switch gears and ask about something from a different angle, which is, uh, I know a lot of your formal studies have been about developmental and organizational psychology. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, what, what are those? What, what are those? Can you speak about what those are? Yeah, so they, these have both been very, very keen interests of mine. And at this point, at least, I feel like I can speak more confidently on organizational psychology. 
Um, I think that's primarily just because I've, you know, since I've been in school with it, I've already like processed a lot more of my thinking, like developmental psychology, I've been studying for longer, but the way that I study it is like very embodied. Like I don't study it intellectually, which makes it harder to talk about. Like I'll, <laughs> I'll literally like I'll read stuff, but I've no, I've like often have very little attention to whether I understand it intellectually. I'm like, I'm trying to like eat it with my body which like sounds really strange, but most accurately represents like the way I read <laughs> developmental psychology. And the reason I do this is because when I read it with my head, I'm just constantly comparing myself. I'm like, do I do this? Do I do that? Am I this good? Am I not this good? Um, and I find that kind of un unhelpful. Um, so, so broadly, I'd say that developmental psychology describes specific shifts that people experience over the course of their life in terms of how they're able to understand um, reality, how they understand themselves, how they understand the world. And often those shifts are relatively categorical. That's not to say there's not also um, like, that it's not also uh, like a fluid spectrum, um, but that there are certain groupings that occur. Most commonly people are familiar with Piaget. So in like the classic example, you have like two glasses and like one's tall and skinny and one's short and fat and you have an amount of water in here and you pour it in. And at a certain age, people, children will begin to be aware that it's the same amount of water, even though in the tall skinny glass, it looks like this much. In the short fat glass, it looks like that much. And so it's like a very clear developmental capacity that evolves in childhood. Um, and so I've studied more adult developmental capacities, which are more subtle because they generally don't involve like, you know, conservation of liquid, which is what this is. Um, and they're more so about, um, it depends on who you look at. Different people study different aspects of developmental psychology. So there's been one strong thread about moral development. How do I understand morality and how does that change over your life? Um, how do I understand my sense of self? How do I relate to my emotions? How, what is my understanding of, of the world? And so depending on who you read, there are a lot of different stage theories. Um, and a lot of them generally tend towards like, um, something of like an expansion in your understanding of something, like the, um, the arena of what you're able to understand grows. So even if you think about like a small child who, who like gives their mom a teddy bear because that's what would make them feel better. And then at some point you learn like some things make some people feel better and other things make other people feel better. And other people will have like totally different like experiences of what makes them feel better than I do. And it's like also valid. And so that's like a big mental shift. Um, and so I've been very interested in, um, in these like subtle but super profound shifts that happen um, during adulthood and how like humans are able to understand their world. And to me, it really, it's really the sense of like, um, there's this term like moral scope, which refers to like the group of people who you think are deserving of the like the morals that you hold yourself to. So like anyone who you wouldn't want to treat differently than you treated yourself. And to me, the um, like moral development, you could say like expands that circle of like who belongs, um, who belongs in your moral scope, who is worthy of consideration. And there's a way you can make this move, which is like not quite making the move. Like if you're like super like worried about those like children over in Africa and you're like, my moral scope is huge, but you like, you know, like forget about the people who are, who are next to you, you know, like that's still a pretty narrow um, scope. Um, and so this also can happen in other ways, particularly in your experience of yourself, people's experience of themselves can change substantially over their course of their lifetime. Sometimes we talk about like midlife crisis can be one particular kind of shift where people have um, like done a lot of what society expected of them. And then they're like, why am I doing all of this? And they have this kind of like about turn and can like transform their lives in different ways. Um, so that's kind of the developmental psych, my developmental psych uh, like window in. Yeah. And then organizational psychology. Yeah. So most basically organizational psychology is the study of how organizations function. It's also called like business psychology or work psychology. Um, classically, it's been called industrial organizational psychology because it really started in like manufacturing plants and intense um, like factories and intense um, settings where like work was being done much more efficiently. 
Um, the way that I think about organizational psychology, I think is particularly loose. Um, and the way I summarize it is when there's a group of individuals who are working towards a superordinate goal. Um, and so that could even be a family, you know? And so organizational psychology is not properly about the family. And there are psychologies that are about the family. Um, but to me, the way that organizational psychology has very intensely and rigorously explored how environments affect people, how people's dynamics affect outcomes is like, it's like meticulous in a way that's much less common in like sociology or in like ethnographies or in like family oriented therapy, just because the goals are so different and the lenses are so different. And so there's, I've, I've really appreciated the, like the rigor of that field applied to many different sorts of superordinate goals that a group of individuals might pursue. How do these two fields of psychology relate in your mind? Ooh, the zinger. <laughs> so, so Robert Keegan has been one of my, um, one of my favorite influences in, in this field. And he wrote a book called The Ever in Culture um, about, he wrote it with, um, with Lisa Leahy about organizations that can become containers that support adult development. And so one of the things that I'm most interested in is how you create organizations like that. How do you create organizations or groups that like deeply support the growth and development of the people that are involved, if not more people beyond, uh, beyond their scope. And this is important to me because in my view of it, developmental capacity and shifts in developmental capacity are one of the most significant levers for societal growth and development. And when there's a lot of fear and anxiety, we tend to revert back to previous stages. And when we're able to come to like higher stages, while they're not better, they can handle, often handle more complexity. They can handle a wider moral scope in a way that can enable like what you might call systems change. Um, or the creation of, of systems that more effectively manage bigger problems. Um, and so in my view, developmental psych is really, um, is a really helpful way to look at the sorts of capacities that people might need to really create the kind of world we might all hope to see. Um, and I, I don't know if it's helpful to go too much into what that would look like and like people have different conceptions, um, but in my conception to, to create a society where like people have the basics of what they need, um, regardless of exactly how they come to get it. And where there's like a level of group coherence that enables good decision-making and good um, society-wide systems um, to be in place, regardless of how big those societies end up being. Like regardless of whether it's on like, for example, in a really like concrete way, whether it's on a state level or whether it's on a national level, um, like those can both work very well. Um, but the ability to, um, to think in a way and understand in a way that allows for the creation of those systems um, can require certain developmental shifts. And so because people spend so much time in the workplace and for a lot of people, the workplace is like not a fun place that they enjoy being. It's not a place that supports them often it's a place that like creates a lot of stress. Like for my dad, he was a civil engineer and while he loved the work that he did, the environment he was in was just like so, so deeply stressful for him, which then kind of like resonated through our family, you know? Um, and so to me, workplaces are a really wonderful like place to start creating better environments because almost everyone is in them. And also businesses tend to have more money so they can pay and they're generally benefited as well by employee well-being. Increasing employee well-being in a very simplistic way is generally very good for organizational outcomes. So there's a lot of like mutual benefit I see there between supporting employee growth and development and um, having organizations become places that support growth that would have effects that would radiate at least out into families and in my view, like out into wider society. What are some of the open questions that you have that you're interested in exploring in these areas? Mm -hmm. I mean, so one big one is just like, how do you create an organization that like deeply supports growth and development? And 
there are a lot of answers we already have, um, but implementing those answers can be um, shockingly difficult. Like for anyone who's ever tried to make a change in their lives, whether it's like, like for example, I like I started smoking in high school and I didn't smoke heavily, but I smoked enough and I smoked like through college. And I was like, I tried to quit for like four or five years before I managed to quit. And like, it's a, it's extremely hard to create change. Um, and so even though you might know that it's time to stop smoking, it can be really hard to make that change. And so a big part of this to me is that, like, we have a lot of answers. Like, how do we help people orient in a way? And how do we like figure out which specific tools people need in order to begin taking those steps? Um, and so there are also answers we don't have, you know, there's a lot of answers that we don't have, but um, like there, there, there is like a general understanding of like good workplace culture, like clear communication, open feedback, um, sufficient tools to support your work, um, like good superior um, subordinate relationships. Like there are a lot of these pieces that are like very clearly known, um, like employee autonomy is, is one as well. And different people will have different needs, but um, making the move towards implementing even a lot of pretty basic solutions can bring up intense interpersonal dynamics, individual fears and defenses, and then even organizational defenses around like um, innovation and change. Um, there's, there can just be an incredible amount of, um, I think mostly of fear and anxiety when you're trying to make those changes. Um, and so one big part of it is like creating vision. When you have vision, when you have something you know you're working towards, um, when you have an idea of like why you would do something hard, it's like much easier to do difficult things. Like crazy, crazy. Like for me, when I, when I was quitting smoking, the thing that motivated me most was like, I love running and I can like feel it in my lungs. I'm like, no, nah, this is not okay with me. And so knowing like I wanted to be able to run for like probably the rest of my life and not be feeling weird stuff in my lungs, like that was a huge motivator. Um, and so that's like one example of a piece that like, like having, having a clear vision and having a vision that's held by someone in a really honest um, and like grounded way um, is like a huge, can be a huge piece of what enables change. Um, but it, it is, it's like, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to create change in, uh, in routines, so, yeah. Hmm. Is there anything that's uh, near any of the topics that we've been talking about that you'd like to say more about or talk about more? Mm. Mm. You know, one thing that I've been trying to bring in more is like my individual experience of this trajectory that I've been on. Um, I think it's often felt like in the past, especially it's felt like extremely vulnerable for me to like reveal more of like how much I've struggled to like make my way through like my inner material and my like relationship with the world. And so there, so there is some piece of just like, like wanting to be really honest about like how painful and difficult this has been for me. Like, this has been like, like a, like a really intense 10 year process. And like, I'm so much happier now than I was 10 years ago, just like insanely more happy and insanely more like capable of like working with myself and with other people in the world. Um, and it's also been like probably like the most confusing time of my life. Just like, just feeling like so lost and like trying so many different things. And like, I don't know if this is working. I have no idea what this is doing. And it's really this feeling of like groping in the dark. Um, and like, especially this past, like the past like year and a half or so, I've been trying to like piece together exactly what happened. I don't know exactly what happened, um, but I've really like, I went through a bit of like a roller coaster and 
I was living in Kansas City. I moved to Asheville just a few months ago. And I, I think it was like January or September. And I just like was, I had really hit this pit of like, I was like depressed and I was like anxious. And I was like thinking about all these like famous people who committed suicide, like particularly Virginia Woolf and David Foster Wallace. And like finally understanding why they might've done it. Like in a way that in the past, it just like never made sense to me. Like clearly they were so like talented and gifted. Like how could they possibly? And I like, I, I finally, I finally got it. There's something that really clicked for me about like the degree of my participation and the meaning I create in my life. And this, this way in which like, if I don't consent to creating it, it can just not be there. And there's, there's, there's something about that. Like, I don't, I don't think I would call it a realization because it doesn't feel like a realization. It's like not a realization when you like land in the bottom of a pit in like a bunch of like tarry mud, like it doesn't feel like a realization, but it like is a sort of ground, even if it's not quite the ground I was looking for or hoping for, um, or wanting. And I feel like since then I've really um, like my willingness and my capacity to like create my own life has really blossomed. Um, and it was like such a painful process. And I know you and I have talked about like, can we grow in ways that aren't painful, <laughs> you know? And I, and I wonder about this and it was painful and maybe it could have been more, maybe it could have been less. Um, but I feel like I've like kind of like ridden the curve out of that and like found like found my own ways of creating meaning that really click with um, with my understanding of myself um, that are really like in alignment with like how I function. And so there's been this like this like really um notable decline in, in like making myself do things. And that's not because I'm just like living out bad patterns. It's like, I'm actually doing things in way that like, in ways that work with just like how I'm made, like how my personality is constituted and like just the characteristics that happen to be the case for me. Um, and that's been really wonderful and beautiful and hard one. It feels like hard one. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm curious if you, like, that's a sort of first person description of your own experience mm -hmm. of the last year or so. And yeah, I'm curious if you were to look at that from the perspective of everything you've studied, how you would describe mm -hmm. that in terms of developmental psychology. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like this is what I've been trying to do for the last year. Mm -hmm. Like I really have, like, I like read the book and I like look at myself and I like, read the book. <laughs> and, um, I remember when I first, I first got into typology systems about five years ago, I got into like Myers-Briggs, the MBTI, just like INTJ, ENFJ and stuff like that. Um, and there was like this, like really intense hunger to like be able to see myself. And I was like, always trying to triangulate from the outside. Like if I find the right type, then I'll be able to see myself. Um, and since then, like at some point I gave up because I was just like, I can't see myself clearly enough to make an accurate judgment. Like there's too much of like a, like the sales department is just like too online. Like, you know, like, like, like I talked about, like reading this developmental stuff and just like constantly comparing myself. And there's just no way to see myself clearly when like there's that much investment in, in the answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm like so fascinated by this stuff. And actually during that particularly dark period, one of the things that was like of most solace to me was reading like Robert Keegan's The Evolving Self about these like journeys through stages. And so there are parts of me that like, you're this, and there are parts of me that like, you're that. And honestly, I'm, I don't know. Like, I, I do not feel any sort of confidence in a self-diagnosis. Um, and at the same time, there's something about knowing that material 
um, that has been so, so helpful because like no one told me I was going to spend all of my twenties having like an identity crisis. And I don't think I would have described it while I was in that. Like it only really felt like that this past year. Um, but when I read this book, he's like, yeah, it's normal. People go through phases. It can be really difficult when you transition. And like a lot of the very specific experiences he describes just like really, I like really relate with and like feel very seen by. And so something about creating that conceptual lens without even like, without the closure of saying I'm definitely this or I'm definitely that have have been just so helpful in like mapping kind of the flow and the transition of what I've been going through. Yeah. So it's less about uh, definitively ascribing a type or a category <laughs> to yourself for all time and more about uh, having the map show you the territory in a way that's like clarifying and helpful that's not like mm -hmm. permanent or uh fixed but rather is just like illuminating of experience and clarifying mm -hmm. yeah i'd say like like what matters is that something supports me and whether it supports me will depend both on like where i'm at and like how I make sense of the thing that I'm working with. Like I've been studying the Enneagram a lot lately, which is similar. Like you can kind of like fixate on your type and it can be really helpful to have a sense of your own personality structure because it makes it easier to, for me, it makes it easier to like have compassion with myself, have compassion with like understanding other people and to start to see more like aspects of myself that otherwise are really hard to see. Um, but that like the, the true value is in its capacity to reflect something back to me in a way so that I can see it about myself. And so like, so like if I am a certain stage or if I am a certain type, if I am in a certain stage or if I am a certain type, that description or the things that are said about that thing should reflect more back to me that will be nutritious for me to see myself more deeply um so there's kind of like a natural alignment that can happen there without it being about like I am here or I am there but it being about like how is this helping me see more clearly what I am already experiencing what I am already um, going through. And we can have a lot of really confusing ideas about this. Like people can get very fixated on like, I'm this or I'm that and be totally wrong and then be thrown off, you know, or be right, but make it only about like, now I know, you know, and those both kind of, to me, miss like the point of like the real, the richness of having certain supports or resources that truly help you see what's already going on, which is something I think circling. And meditation and therapy it can be very good at. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I'm curious. We've touched on this a little bit before in terms of your open questions, but like just to revisit it a little bit, like what you know, you're applying to PhD programs in the fall, and um, I'm curious what you would like to do in the coming years, and like where what mm -hmm. what you would like to see happen or accomplish or discover mm. yeah so th the focus of my of my um my current understanding of my research focus is about creating organizations that enable um like true development and change for people in a way that also benefits the organization like it has to be mutually beneficial um and I really, I really like, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of approaching this from multiple angles, from the subjective angle, from the interpersonal, the group level, and from the organizational level. And so in my mind, at least right now, I really appreciate the scholarly approach to that because often you're um, like, generally you'll end up teaching classes. So you're talking with students and having conversations about topics. And they often say like teaching things is the best way to learn them, you know? Um, so that to me can constitute like one form of the group 
of the group experience. There's research, which can go on any of those, but it has a little bit more of the objective flavor um, generally. And then I've been doing group facilitation for about five years now, and I would love to continue that in terms of that like real time exploration. And so in my mind, all of those work together in ways that are really symbiotic around this topic that has become so important to me from the like somatic embodied perspective and from the intellectual perspective and from the sense of like, how do we actually create something because organizational psych is so applied. It's like, it's not, it's not about being theoretical, even though theory can be extremely, extremely useful. And one of the most useful things it's very applied. Um, and so having those three areas of exploration to me feels very uh, like, potent and exciting. And I don't know exactly, I don't think I could say like, what would I create? But my hope would be that I could work with any organization who wanted to make these sorts of changes um, to help them do so. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to say while we're still talking? Nothing's coming to mind. Hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for talking about all these things with me. It's such mm -hmm. a fascinating collection of interests and topics that we've covered. And uh, I really appreciate you talking about them with me. Mm, thank you for your questions and your interest. Mm. Yeah.